All right. Well, once again, welcome everyone. This is Mike Barrett. I'm a product manager over on the OpenShift uh, engineering team. Uh, today's discussion is going to be centered around storage. But, but before we get into that, I just wanted to thank everyone for their involvement in the comments. Hopefully you saw the public announcement that we put out today and went over our uh, business wire. So a lot of attention is now being brought to the comments. And uh, that is all because of you. So uh, thank you for joining and uh, participating in this forum. Uh, like I said, today's uh, arrangement or session or event is on storage. Uh, we have one of our lead engineers in this area, Mark Transky, on the line. Uh, Mark is going to take us through what he's been working on over the last couple of weeks, where he is in the, in the code, and um, hopefully show us uh, why we're going to be using this uh, remote storage solution and how it's going to be implemented. I'll turn it over to you, Mark. My name is Mark Taranti, and I'm an engineer at Red Hat working on OpenShift implementation of persistent storage. We have an hour scheduled for this talk, but lucky for all of us, I can effectively explain our approach to storage in a dozen slides or so. It'll we'll take about 10 minutes, and after the hat, we'll have a lot more time uh, for questions, and I hope I can answer them all effectively. In the next few slides, I'll show you the user experience of cluster administrators and application developers as they create and consume cluster resources, specifically storage. We have three goals overall for storage in OpenShift. We want to allow administrators to describe the storage available in their cluster in a way that application developers can discover and request as a resource. Meanwhile, we need to ensure storage as a resource is reliable and not bound to any particular technology. Doing so allows us to be flexible enough to work in all data centers and environments. Now, for something as unique and as important as your data, your pet, or cattle. It's an important question, I think. Uh, this is a slide from a presentation out of Stern where they're using cloud platforms to manage and crunch all the data coming out of the large Hadron Collider. The last bullet is interesting, I think, because it suggests the hybrid approach. It says we should aim for mostly cattle, but still, also warranted and needed at turn, just as they will be needed sometime in the data centers of some of Red Hat's corporate customers and partners. So, how do we do this? Just as admins provision a cluster with nodes, an admin will provision a cluster with storage. Many ways to script and automate resource provisioning exist who are being developed. We need to automate as much of that as possible for it, while recognizing that some infrastructure and some environments will be easier to dynamically provision than others. But it all begins with an admin provisioning the cluster. Persistent volumes are resources like nodes. They're created by an administrator, they're owned by the cluster, and they're not namespace. The persistent volume is backed by an actual volume existing somewhere in the underlying infrastructure. Persistent volumes are created uh, using API, like other resources. So what kind of storage are available? I mean, actually, all kinds of storage can be made to be supported. Volumes are implemented as plugins, and many plugins exist. More are in development. Red Hat is currently working on plugins for NFS, I study Bluster, I know Steph is being talked about, uh, and many others. Volume plugins are a natural extension point because if we can develop a plugin for something, we can map that volume in OpenShift. If just as a pod is a request for a slice of computing resources, a persistent volume plane is a request for storage resources. Plane well, live in a namespace, like a pod. The API used to create claims is also used to discover what kind of storage is available, as described by size and the mounting capabilities of the volume of the infrastructure. In this example, the developer is requesting a volume that can be mounted in two ways, read write once and read only many. In this example, you can assume the developer queried the API 
and learn what kind of mountain capabilities were available in terms of the volume in order to make that specific request. It's important for that app developer to be able to rely upon that published behavior, as you'll see an example in just a few slides, where we use and then change the access mode of our pod volume. Claims are matched and bound to available volume in the system, which means that it's possible for some claims to go unmatched. But when you do have a claim, and it is bound to a matching volume, you can use your claim as a volume in your pod. We are implementing this actually as another kind of volume plugin. Our plugin allows OpenShift to find the back to find the volume backing the claim and make that one available to the pod. The application developer has the same control that they did before, specifically with regard to the access modes and how the volume is mounted. But now they're decoupled entirely from the actual volume itself. They can focus on application development while admins manage the high availability of the cluster and its data. Now, this is important. Persistent volumes have a life cycle that is longer than the pods that use them. You can delete your pod, but retain access to your data because you still have your claim to your data. Your data outlives your pod. In this example, uh, the volume is being mounted. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. All right, so here we are. We're reusing now our same plan in a completely different pod. In this case, the volume is being mounted to 10 pods in a read only mode to highlight how a developer can take advantage of the multiple ways to mount and find the volume. In this example, we're low balancing our data, say, across a number of front end uh, web servers. But we'll notice though that the, the same volume, the same volume is used first in read, write, once mode, as it's in a pod, and now used many times in read only many mode uh, for many replicas behind the replication controller. Now, you release your data, now, you release your claim to delete your data. Releasing a claim will cause that volume to be recycled. How a volume is recycled depends entirely on the type of volume it is and its provider. Different volumes will have different life cycles. So, we just pet the cattle. To a developer, their data has identity to them, but it's completely decoupled from the implementation. All aspects of managing that storage are left to admin. But to an admin, storage can be either. Dynamic provisioning is cattle storage, but to quote CERN, pets with strong configuration management are viable and being needed. OpenShift supports both case, both use cases equally. And as a result, everybody's happy, calculator dance party, and that's how we're approaching storage in OpenShift. We're decoupling developers from the infrastructure, having provision storage in the cluster, using discover and consumer storage resources. And OpenShift removes direct coordination between the two while remaining flexible enough to work across all types of environments. And that's pretty much how we're doing it. Um, this represents the workflow, the, uh, the actual user experience for both the administrative side and the application developer side. And uh, hopefully, maybe the training shall meet. But this is our approach. I hope it made sense. Uh, I'm available to take questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. So uh, take us through it more step by step verbally, if you could. Like if, uh, if I'm a, an admin, I pretty much know how to get some storage from my array, be it an iSCSI volume or a fiber channel attached volume. You know, most of the time, I would make that phone call and I would say, hey, give me, give me 50 10 gigabit volumes. And I would get that that pool associated to me. What's my next step in the OpenShift platform? How do I use those? <clears throat> well, there are a number of ways to do that. <clears throat> me. Um, because all volumes are created with the API, and let me go back to that page uh, for the admin and speak to it. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, all volumes are created and provisioned uh, in a cluster via the API. Now, we can create many, many ways. Let me go back one more. We can create many ways uh, to automatically create those resources. Whether they are, say, playbooks that simply automate a tedious path, or whether they are more sophisticated dynamic provisioners that can, make, that can support more dynamic environments like cloud environments or, uh, or resources storage where the double via an API, for example, more cloud like storage. Either way, uh, the admin will upfront describe their resource and they're going to help automate that various way of creating those resources in the cluster. So uh, if you make all if you make all your resources manually, you need to make sure you are tracking all those IDs so that when you post them to the API via whatever scripted mechanism, they will all become part of the cluster. Otherwise, you can take advantage of some dynamic provisioners that can automatically make those resources and manage them for us. So we can replace that task if they're tracking all of those IDs and whatnot. So we will support both manual creation of storage as we do it, and likewise the automatic creation of those via dynamic provisions. Okay, so on the next slide in that stanza that you were showing me, that's where I, I have to describe when I'm giving it the iSCSI or the fiber channel in this block. That's right. Okay. Um, beneath spec, uh, it's actually in line, but you see a source normally before it says the last block store. There's a source attribute that has become in line. But the specific thing being, this represents an actual, whereas the end users, the application developers, have claims from some loosely coupled thing you know, to the volume. The admin even deals with actual. So there would be a plugin for iSCSI, a plugin for NFS, a plugin for whatever type, EVA, EBS in this case on this slide. A plugin representing each volume type will be implemented, and then the either manually or in an automatic fashion to create all the data. And post it into the API. Okay, and this this definition is at the pod level, right? No, this is its own top level object. Okay. The system volumes live outside of a pod. They have identity and they have longevity that outlasts the pod. Great. So we first create this object. It now lives all by itself, and then later we we use that same volume in a claim. Excuse me. Claim here is not from the user side. Here. As a pod, we use our claim in place of a volume. Our implementation of our uh, of our claim will find and match the real volume and expose it to the pod. Oh, very nice. So it's a claim a sort of demand situation. And then how how does this pod then give it to the Docker container that's living inside it? That is all the same as uh, as Kubernetes and OpenShift works today. So you can define it as a volume plugin. Hubert running on the node will mount, uh, will mount it to the host, uh, attach and mount it in some cases, uh, and of course expose it to uh, the Docker. All that is unchanged. We are just making essentially this feature is our way of creating and managing many volumes and providing that indirection via the claim to these more persistent resources. Okay, and then all, all these are shared storage to begin with. They're either NFS volumes or iSCSI volumes or fiber channel volumes. What if I um, what if I fail my pod or evacuate a node or something? How does it? How does uh, Kubernetes bring my storage to my new node for me? Sure, that's a great question. <clears throat> uh, there are well, first there are reconciliation loops and everywhere throughout uh, throughout the cluster. Uh, your volume will be unmounted and so on and detached. If your pod crashes and burns, uh, the host will also cube will ultimately reconcile your volume off of that host. Uh, and because your network volume they can follow your pod anywhere. As your pod goes to the next host, that cube running on that host will run the volume plugin. And the volume plugin knows how to either attach and mount and so on and all the things specific to that type of volume. Gotcha. And then um, this uh, this is obviously at the fact that you you, know, you already have a node up, you already have Kubernetes up or OpenShift up. Um, how does the but uh, what's the story around at the host level for his shared storage? Like what if what if he's made of of shared storage to begin with or local storage? Right, I don't think I follow that question. Can you repeat that? 
Um, Jeff, if you could unmute your line, maybe you can represent the question better. Uh, Jeff McCormick. I, I, I see Jeff's question in the little chat window okay. about local storage. Uh, local storage was quite specifically not implemented in this particular uh, function. So how local will be handled is going to be completely different. Now that said, if we wanted to define uh, some volumes that are, there are local volumes, a host path, for example, is a local volume uh, in Kubernetes. And if we wanted to, we could make it such that the cluster knew about all of them as persistent volumes. And that would require the scheduler to preferentially schedule your pod onto the same node that has your data. But all of the mechanics of making that data highly available mobile and so on were or are very complicated. So we kind of will do nothing. Uh, we'll go very specific and say let's kind of punt on all that complexity and go with uh, the network volumes such as uh, the, the, the iSCSIs and so on and all these big block storage devices and so on. We represent a whole lot of use cases, works great in the cloud. Uh, and that's what we're going with with this particular feature. Gotcha. Can you talk maybe a little bit more about the, the developer? How how do you think we're going to expose this claim process to him? Like, uh, you know, I, I now have my application out. I suddenly decide, hey, I, I want some storage. Is there like an OSC command that I'm issuing? Is it? Um... Yeah. yeah so first, in, uh, discovery of storage is important. Uh, specifically with regard to the types of behavior, the amount modes that are available. So people need to know about that and rely upon it. So first, I expect the developer to go to the, the cluster to see what kind of storage is available generally. And it will be described uh, by its attributes, because right now what we need the mount mode, the access mode, uh, and the size. Other attributes might be the IOPS or throughput or some of the things we gleaned from the web API the cloud providers. But the important ones really are the access mode and size. So if the developer can see what is available, they can make a request that since they're new. So we first discover what's available and then post their actual claim. And just as they would post a pod and watch it go from pending to running state, they would watch their claim go from pending to found state. And when found, they will get actual. They can see what actually dying uh, and back their claim. In this example, uh, this developer says, I just need three gigs. The closest size volume that's in the cluster might be a five gig volume, for example. Since we haven't gone under what they asked for, maybe we'll give them a, a five gig. And they can therefore look at their specific claim and say, okay, I've got my two mount modes, I've got a five gig storage, and they're happy. Once they see their claim has been satisfied and bound to a real volume, they can then use that claim as their volume. That's awesome. So the, um, this shared storage that you know gets attached to the pod, gets mounted in through that uh, Docker container. Um, you know, at that point, it's just a it's just a mount directory in the Docker container that an application could use to write what it believes to be persistent storage that is actually living remotely, right? That's exactly right. It's awesome. Well, that's I mean that's that's fantastic. That will probably open the door to a lot more applications running on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it won't just be HTTP uh, 12 factor, which it can totally cater to, but it also opens the door to a, a larger breadth of possibilities. That's right. Uh, persistent storage, you know, for, for databases and whatnot, has been one of the most uh, requested features upstream. So you're absolutely right. This will open doors to lots of different stuff. Now, what, um, it, yeah, go ahead. Somebody have a question? This is Judd, yeah. Um, about my shared storage question, are there any, um, uh, 
nouns added to um, shared persistent block storage, like an NFS or uh, an iSCSI, to help the NFS or iSCSI systems manage where and how things are mounted. Um, what would a what would a typical like mount uh, or uh, iSCSI mount string look like? Is it, does it change at all? Uh, that's a great question, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure I exactly know uh, offhand right now. But that said, uh, the NFS plugin that uh, Chris Alfonso, which right now currently is the final touches on, it has um, a server address and, and a name and a mount option, so you know, read only or read write and so on. So I think it's full support of what NFS can do. Um, generally speaking, there aren't that many proxies required to make this work. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean by what it's going to look like. Um, I'm not really sure exactly, but there are only three properties we've got for NFS, so I don't think it would be terribly complex. Which is a really not answer for you. I'm sorry. And I think, I think what you have no problem. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you have any requests for like, do you have any requests for like Galera or GFS? Because I remember there's all these fence Ds and stuff that you got to have running, and there's a certain amount of quorum that you have to establish. Um, uh, is that on your roadmap, or does it matter on either? Right. It's not on mine specifically, and I've not heard of some of these that you talk about uh, within really OpenShift, but that does not mean they can't be supported. Uh, I'm already working with people who are not on OpenShift, but who work in Red Hat. We're working on plugins for many of our, uh, our pieces of storage. So if we can create a plugin for it, it can be mounted in OpenShift. Where and how that plugin gets developed, uh, I don't know. Uh, my responsibility currently is to make this volume management framework uh, if it's in place. NFS was the story that we are using that is not a cloud volume as our first reference implementation, so to speak. After that, we're leaving it to others to do iSCSI and Gluster and so on. And these are being worked out, uh, worked on now by some people at Red Hat. Yeah, that, that's a good good point, Mark. The, um you're you're putting back a lot of pull requests to Kubernetes itself, right? Around the um, around that that layer, and we're we're really working on the user experience on how to how to call and how to uh, make these claims, right? Right, right. This is all going upstream, and then when it comes back downstream into OpenShift, there's lots we can do to customize in ways that Google might not be interested in, uh, and the automatic provisioning of say. You know, 300 elastic block store volumes. That might be a great Ansible playbook. Or if someone has a great big honking NFS file server on their network in a corporate environment, that's a pet. And we can probably make, we can make um, automation scripts or playbooks or what have you that will carve that up and expose them all as volumes in the cluster. Either way, there's a ton of ways that we can automate creation of these things. And likewise, we can create many more volume plugins. Support custom environments and people specifically. Cool. You know, one one struggle in this area is when you want to have two separate entities being able to leverage the same storage. Um, NFS, you know, allows that at the file system layer. And some other technologies like Gluster have locking mechanisms. Have, have you started to run into that at all when people want to have three pods all writing to the same volume? Yeah, we're, and I think Jeff's question in, in the chat too asked me about you know blocking across pods. Uh, we are punting on that. Uh, that I don't think is going to be a responsibility of either Kubernetes or OpenShift. If developers want to have write uh, read write many with say NFS, they're going to have to handle file locking and contention on their own. Well, that could potentially come in through the Gluster file system plugin or the um, you know a three dot one release of OpenShift. Right, we can get better too. Okay, I've I've been talking a lot. Um, any other questions on the line? You can just unmute your phone and feel free to ask any questions. Is there any demand out there? Any demand? I know this sounds completely ridiculous, but my boss is going to ask about it. Um, any demand for Cinder out there? Um, Cinder, yeah, that's been talked about. talked about as well because I believe. I recall Cinder is implemented in OpenStack, I think. So that is, I think, uh, uh, we can talk about as well. 
Yes. Um, my particular boss comes from the storage world and he's working, he's running our OpenStack team now. Um, and he'll be very interested in, uh, in being able to leverage all the work that we put into Cinder I'm with Dell to make our, our Devil storage gear available. Um, could be very interesting. Sure. Um, would, would it, is it completely, no, no, I'm sorry. Um, just, I thought it might be completely ridiculous, but maybe it would, no other OpenStack product but Cinder to allow um, OpenShift to act with a variety of different storage. I'm sorry, are you saying that Cinder act with a proxy, so to speak, to make kind of storage for me? Yeah. That's cool. You know, in the end, if we can make a volume plugin out of it, we can mount it. So whether it's a single Cinder plugin and that represents many things behind it, that's great. Or whether OpenShift itself is implementing many plugins within it. That's great too. Either way, I think it's the same flexibility. The other part of this is the provisioning piece. The volume plugin is how Kubernetes will mount this volume and expose it to a pod. The provisioning of that volume is the other half of this equation. So if we wanted some automatic means of having OpenStack be a dynamic provisioner, which it certainly can be, uh, that implementation would also have to take place. So it's first the plugin to make it work and have it mountable, which means all of the volumes are created initially manually, so to speak, or, or by hand, they're all kind of tested real. But the very next step, the dynamic provisioner of that type of volume would make it automatic, make it more like tech. Yeah, and this is Joe from the OpenShift team. Just to add to that, you know, we had a similar conversation uh, last week on the comments call related to networking and how OpenShift is going to be able to leverage, uh, you know, native SDN capabilities, but also plug into third-party SDN solutions through Kubernetes. Um, you know, OpenStack, you know, Neutron is, is something that we're working on there on the networking side, and, you know, similar to, to the storage side, right? Like if for OpenShift on OpenStack scenarios, which are very common, we see all the time, um, having that pluggability to, to Cinder or to Neutron then opens us up to, to let the, the infrastructure layer, the IAD layer, uh, manage storage and networking and then plug into the various options that already are uh, plumbed at that layer. So something that we're definitely very conscious of in working together with our OpenStack team uh, around. Great. Hey, Mark, can you forward to the slide where you call out the plugins that uh, sure. the, the community is working on? And maybe after the uh, meeting, you can forward me the uh, the URL to that part of the Kubernetes um, project, so in case people want to go and look at it. Sure. Uh, there are three requests currently for NFS and iSCSI. I know Gus is getting work done, but it's not yet a, uh, a PR into Kubernetes for it. And likewise, anything else that we create. Uh, I'll need to get with, uh, with like Clayton and, and Dan McPherson and some of you guys. I'm sure that there are some good ways too. We can get lots of these plugins and provisions and so on and open the chip if they aren't necessarily all accepted upstream. Uh, currently, we're looking all upstream for the feature and all the plugins and whatnot. But there's no reason that really has to happen. We, of course, can all work together and make and expertly support all the storage that, uh, that Red Hat offers and make it work seamlessly in open chip. Great. So, uh, you know, Jeff or Judd or Keith or Nick, um, any any other questions for Mark? Cindy, Tom. Um, only question is, if there's if we've got more questions, can we reach out on the OpenShift mailing list? Yeah. <laughs> we monitor it. Do you have a question? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I'm also in uh, all of the OpenShift IRT channels and whatnot, and I'm readily available for any questions you may have. Excellent. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Well, you know, once again, thank you for joining the comments. Uh, this will be the last one in February. As we look into March, we'll have more exciting things to present to you. So uh, if you're in the Northeast, stay warm, and uh, we'll talk to you in March. Thanks, everyone. 
All right. Thank you so much, Gary. Appreciate your time.